All right, welcome to Home Queer Home, a modern guide to shared housing in the LGBTQ plus community. My name is Amanda Redfern, I'm a housing navigator at Triangle Community Center in Norwalk. And this is a presentation to really discuss how shared living is a great option for folks who are facing loneliness, financial insecurity, or just really want a change up from the usual housing environment. So this presentation consists of three parts to kind of break down why we would want to do a shared housing situation, what it looks like, how to navigate through it, and then how to make it last. So part one is shared housing, who, what, and why. So we'll go over a brief history of shared queer living arrangements, why choosing shared housing might be a good idea for you, benefits to shared living with other LGBTQ plus people, things to consider before choosing a shared living model, how to find a roommate, uh, and questions to ask a potential roommate. So shared housing, what does it mean and why do you want to do it? So shared housing is any living arrangement where multiple people live together with shared common areas. This can include roommates, housemates, intentionally integrated communities, dormitories, and or cohabiting romantic partners, among other people. So a brief history of shared queer living arrangements. Um, queer folks have been doing shared living arrangements since, really since it became something that was beneficial to them. It started even just in the 1800s um, with like the Boston marriage, which was where usually femme presenting individuals would cohabitate with each other. Um, not, even, not even as a queer um, relationship, but sometimes just as a way to shirk those gender roles that limited their financial opportunities and who they could stay with and also provided support um, so they were not lonely. Uh, in the 1910s, we saw kind of a resurgence of queer artists and intellectuals who were living together so that they could live free from public scrutiny. Um, it would be nice to portray yourself one way out in public and then be able to come home to a space that feels affirming and freeing for you. Um, one of these situations was the uh, Charleston Farmhouse um, that belonged to Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell um, out in the UK. It evolved into um, the Bloomsbury Group, which was actually a collection of intellectuals, artists, musicians, writers who would be able to spend time together in a space where they could explore their gender and sexuality in a way that was open and creative. Um, they had some pretty high profile folks stay with them, uh, including Virginia Woolf and T.S. Eliot. So as the 70s and 80s occurred, and we saw a lot of political changes, um, both in the US and in the UK, we saw a lot of radical communities, um, folks that were occupying empty homes and um, just really living together, sharing resources, and doing so through that safety in numbers. It also allowed them to be housed and safe where other people were thinking that they were not safe. Um, this was ongoing during the AIDS um, pandemic where there was an issue with so many people being afraid to even just rent to people who were HIV positive. And then in the 90s um, through the present, we see a popping up of intentional living communities. These are usually spaces that are either you know, uh, separate rooms or sometimes even separate uh, apartments or houses that have shared living um, spaces, uh, like shared common areas like kitchens, courtyards, um, dining halls, places where people with shared values can come together, um, mostly to be able to form a sense of community um, that goes outside of just something fine, like with financial security. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of these places in this area, but they do pop up in major cities like San Francisco, Chicago, and Seattle. 
So some relationships you might find in a shared living space um, would be a queer platonic relationship, um, such as like cohabitating folks that are more than friends, but less than lovers. Um, this happens a lot in um, arrow and ace relationships, or just even with folks that want a space with uh, somebody they have a connection with that's just simply not romantic or sexual. Um, cohabitation usually is um, for unmarried romantic or sexual partners living together, um, whether marriage is in the cards for them or whether it's something they're not interested in. Those are still valid relationships. Uh, and housemates and roommates, usually those are just folks that share space and that is the basis and sometimes just the extent of their relationship. You don't necessarily have to be friends or lovers with your roommate, um, but it does happen sometimes. And then relatives um, by related by blood or marriage. We see this a lot in um, cultures where people share multi-generational um, family life at home um, and you have folks from different generations together, or even just extended family or friends all living under the same room. So why choose shared housing? Living with another person is a lot more common than you think. Uh, a Pew Research poll back in 2018 showed that uh, about 32% of adults live with a roommate who they wouldn't classify as a romantic partner or a relative. Um, and there are some great reasons why somebody might do that, including just financial, emotional, social, and safety reasons um, why you might want to room with another person. So financially, um, it's expensive to live by yourself these days. Uh, so having somebody else there to help share costs of utilities and rent um, is really something that could help you financially when it comes to living. Uh, it also could include a lower security deposit because you're not getting a space that um, is its own one bedroom or two bedroom or even a studio um, or renting a room. It could be much cheaper. Um, avoiding the cost of a house sitter or a pet sitter when you go out of town. It's something that you don't really think about, but those costs definitely add up. Um, and then uh, the ability to pool financial resources for shared experiences. Um, these are good things to do so that when financial decisions need to be made, they don't have to be made alone and they can, you guys can share some of the responsibility for them. And then more flexibility uh, with your options in terms of rentals and lease terms. Um, sometimes um, room rentals or um, shared housing situations can be a little bit more flexible and have shorter um, rentals or lease terms depending on the situation. So another great reason to opt into a shared housing situation would be just emotional needs, um, primarily loneliness. So a psychologist at Harvard um, who was working on loneliness in young people during the pandemic said that um, folks that are 18 to 25 really do need a robust social infrastructure to help mitigate the effects of loneliness on self-worth and mood. Um, this doesn't go just for 18 to 25 year olds. I think it goes for everybody. But during this really important period in your life, you, you do need a good foundation in order to base the rest of it. Um, I was surprised to find that loneliness has been recognized as a major public health concern related to uh, heightened risk of mental and physical illness, cognitive decline, suicidal behavior, and all cause mortality. Um, it's really interesting. We tend to downplay the effects of emotional and mental health on the rest of our body, but it's very clear that just being on your own can be can really be detrimental to your health. And then um, it's been noted that risk factors for loneliness include being between the ages of 18 and 30 and living alone. So hence the point of this presentation. So other good reasons to consider shared housing um, are just ways to meet new people and um, to preserve your safety. So um, maybe finding a roommate, uh, you guys can become more than just roommates and a friendship can occur. Um, sometimes even if you don't hit it off with your roommate, they might have friends that you do. And then also it's 
always nice that if you're both new to an area, you can explore new places together um, and you can show each other around, you know, discover which restaurants are on the must to go list, which ones are not. Um, find the best parking spots together, find the best grocery stores. It's all kind of fun when you have somebody else that you can share those experiences with. And then with safety, um, especially with our community, safety is really important. So considering that there's if there's more activity in the house, it'll deter burglars or other people that are trying to do you harm. And um, that there's safety in numbers when other people come to the house. So this could include um, your date or your roommate's date, um, having maintenance workers over like a plumber to fix your sink, or even just having your landlord come by for routine maintenance or to just check on the space. Um, having uh, other people there can make you feel safer and more confident to be able to do what you need to do. Um, and it could also potentially um, make you guys a less likely target if somebody was going to try to do something nefarious. So benefits to shared living with other LGBTQ uh, folks in particular. Um, being in an affirming space has a positive effect on mental health. The Trevor Project actually cited affirming homes as one of the most crucial factors in reducing suicide in LGBTQ youth and young adults. So that is an incredibly important component to living with other folks and having a space that you feel safe in. Um, and then even just having one affirming space helps reduce suicidal behavior in trans and non-binary youth, youth by 25% which in my opinion is a really impactful number when it comes to um, how at risk these folks are for, um, for suicidal behavior and action. Um, consider the fact that you're gonna be free to decorate um, to reflect your sexual um, orientation or your gender orientation. Um, you don't have to be afraid to hang up your pride flag or your Lady Gaga poster or your Kate Bush poster, <laughs> um, whatever you like. Um, and then just even creating a safe space to bring friends and partners to. Um, I know a lot of folks don't feel safe bringing their friends or um, their romantic partners um, to their old home or to a home with um, people that are not affirming. Um, just having a safe space that's not just safe for yourself, but also for the people you care about um, could be a really great reason for um, trying to share a space with somebody else who's part of the community. Um, and then this is a quote from um, Samaya Marshi, who runs the Shea Queer uh, Montreal Facebook group um, for queer shared housing connections. And I think it's important to put since it feels really succinct. It's so important for people to come home to a place where you feel safe in really literal ways, safe from violence, but also just comfortable and at ease, not worried about judgments. So obviously this presentation is about shared housing and how great it is, but there are are things to consider before you do elect to move in with a roommate or even just start that process. Um, compromises need to be made when living with another person. That's regardless of who that person is or what they mean to you, there will be compromises you need to make. You have to consider that there's no total privacy in a shared space. Even if your room is off limits to your roommate, um, you will be sharing things like a kitchen, a bathroom, a driveway, um, a foyer, like all those different things that you um, your things will be intermingled in. Um, also considering learning life skills together or teaching each other new skills. So not everybody pops out of the womb um, knowing how to unload a dishwasher. So learning how to do that or having the patience to teach your roommate how to do that is an important thing to consider. Um, you guys will not have all the same experiences or skills and that's something to remember as you go into this. Considering the interdependence you're gonna have with another person, it can be scary, but also comforting. So knowing that you have to trust and lean on somebody else can make you feel good um, because you realize that you're not in it alone and if um, you need help, you can ask for it, but it also means that you have to trust that other person and hold trust that 
they will be there um, to help if you need it. And they will be there to uphold their end of the bargain um, that they had promised. And then choosing the right roommate is tough, but we are gonna talk about that next. So how to find a roommate? This is a question that seems really evident, but you'd be surprised how many people struggle with it when they're actually tasked with doing it themselves. So I usually recommend social apps like social media groups on Facebook has a bunch of roommate hookup groups. Um, usually they're area specific um, that can help you find folks that are looking for roommates. Um, sometimes they even have room uh, rentals available while they are looking for roommates or even marketplace on Facebook where you can look at rentals and likewise sometimes you can find rentals for rooms that are already being um, hosted in a shared living space and it you really just are finding your space and your roommate all in one. Um, likewise Craigslist also is a great space to find people looking for roommates or roommates who have space looking for their own roommate. Um, Roomy and Roomster are also great places to find roommates um, those are websites specifically um, designed for that. And then Hot Pads is more of an apartment hunting site. However, there are often listings for people who are looking for people to fill vacant rooms in their shared living space, um, much like Marketplace or Craigslist. Networking is old fashioned and not online and, and just really includes just asking folks around you if they or someone they know might be looking to enter into a shared living situation. Um, ask your coworkers, your family members, your friends. Sometimes they might not have a lead for you, but just you asking puts them in their head and they might be able to help you make that connection later on um, when they come across somebody. Um, considering, consider looking for roommates in places that you already go, such as your hobby groups. Um, see if somebody in your D&D party might be looking for a roommate or know somebody who is. Um, volunteer gigs. If you volunteer to do beach cleanup or park cleanup a few times a year, consider if anybody there might be interested or know somebody. Um, sports groups. Um, if you go to sporting events or you're part of like a hobby sports group, see if anybody there is or knows someone who is looking for, for a roommate. And then community centers, a lot of spaces um, have bulletin boards where folks have, can post um, that they're looking for roommates or that they have rooms um, for rent. Check it out and see if there's something there that might work for you. The point is you're never going to find a roommate if you don't actively search and actively ask and there's nothing shameful in it. It's really just marketing. So some questions to ask a potential roommate. These are things that you really want to ask um, because it seems like for a lot of people, they're really just focused on getting into a space. But you have to consider that you're going into a partnership with somebody who's oftentimes a complete stranger. So finding out these things before you sign a lease is more beneficial to you than finding them out two months after you signed your lease. So some things to ask are what's your current work schedule? work hours, school hours, or even kind of what kind of hobbies they're into. This makes a lot of sense um, when you look at how you guys are going to be sharing the space. If you work from home during the day and um, in the afternoon and you find out that the potential roommate teaches tuba to middle schoolers at two o'clock in the afternoon, you're not going to have a very good time. <laughs> Um, considering also if you work nights and you need those morning hours to be very quiet and yet you've got somebody who's um, likes to blast music and be up early in the morning um, making themselves a full breakfast it's also important to consider that. So asking them what their past uh, living arrangements were what worked what didn't work um, this is a great way to get insight as to what they do like in a shared living arrangement and what they don't um, as well as finding out if there's any potential red flags for you, such as, you know, have they gone through roommates, um, like a lot of them, and they can't seem to give you a good reason as to why it didn't work out, 
or if someone has lived at home for a while um, and maybe doesn't know how to live independently or live with other folks and hasn't contributed, um, consider those things. It's important just to ask questions and also just learn from what they say as to how it's going to inform you guys moving forward. All right. Do they have any pet peeves? Do you have any pet peeves? What are deal breakers when it comes to roommates? It is important to consider the little things and how they might affect your future relationship together. And it's good to just get out of it before it becomes something that's permanent. I know a lot of folks say that they don't have any pet peeves and they're just fine with whatever until it actually happens. <laughs> Asking about their budget, what they can comfortably and consistently pay each month. Having um, you knowing your own budget is really important, but also how does that stack up to somebody else's budget? Uh, gen the general rule of thumb is that you want to make sure your rent is no more than 50% of your income and ideally should be more between 25 and 30. Um, that's not always realistic for everybody, but as long as you know you can consistently pay for it, that's what's important. But also, if you're going into a potential roommate situation with somebody whose budget is $600 and your budget is $1,200, are you willing to get into a space that maybe is smaller or doesn't have as many amenities or is farther away from your target area just so that you can have equal contribution to rent? Or are you okay with paying for more things to get a space that you like and having your roommate pay less? These are the questions that you can ask yourself, or you can simply work to on finding a roommate who has a budget closer to yours so things feel a little bit more equitable. And how long can you commit to sharing a rental? This is an important question simply because a lot of leases uh, work, have a very strict timeline. And it also helps you know that you are going into this partnership with somebody uh, and it's not going to just be for a few months at a time. Um, if it's July and this potential roommate is looking to potentially go to school in the fall, that might inform whether you want to risk uh, having them as a roommate if you're just going to have to be finding a new roommate in two months. So these are just some of the questions that you can ask and I encourage you to ask. But I also say that it's important to ask your own questions. So think really hard about who you want to share a space, space with and what things you don't want to leave to be surprises. So part two of our presentation um, is called Securing a Rainbow Roof, Finding, Leasing, and Leaving a Shared Space. So in this, we essentially go through the nitty gritty on finding a location, um, creating a lease or working on a lease that works for everybody resolving conflicts with your roommate once you do move in, and then uh, considering what happens when someone leaves and how to navigate through that. So imagine you found your roommate and you wanna get a place together and it's not a space that you, it was already a let space that you needed to um, just show up at. So securing a space can be complicated, especially when you have multiple people involved. The key to hunting for a space together is keeping communication open, listening and considering each other's needs and tackling each phase as a team. If you're organized, prepared and know what you want and are in sync with your roommate, you will look much more attractive to potential landlords. And believe me, you have to look as attractive as physically possible when it comes to trying to secure a space these days. So finding a space, considering where you folks wanna to go together. Location, it's important, but what works for both of you? Considering uh, transportation to and from the space. We all know that the farther out you get from the urban areas, the cheaper the rents get, but also the more wear and tear on your car and the less options for um, public transportation. So consider those things um, as you look at a space. If you're commuting, consider how much time you're losing. Um, it's not very difficult to have a one hour commute one way, but at the end of the day, you're losing about two hours out of your day and that's 10 hours out of your week. What could you be using that for? So think about if that's worth the gamble or worth the lower rent cost or, or whatnot. 
And then with location, you also want to consider safety. Do you feel comfortable? And by that, I don't mean just what's the crime rate look like or, you know, what's the what are the police stats? I also just mean where do you feel comfortable that you can be? Um, is there a political sign at a house across the street from this potential rental that makes you feel uncomfortable? Um, is this an area that feels um, like it doesn't belong, that you don't belong in it, that you feel that interacting with your neighbors or walking around during the day or in the evening is going to make you feel uncomfortable? Those are things to ask yourself. It really goes beyond um, just the general sense of what it means to be safe. But in our community, it's especially important to consider safety when we are choosing a place to live. So another thing to consider is your rent. So what can you real realistically split, split equally, even if hours are cut at work or something happens? So a lot of people like to consider what they make on a good month as a realistic uh, setting for what they're supposed to be making every month, but we all know that that's not the case. Um, people get sick, people's cars break down, and they lose two days at work. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why somebody may not have as good of a month or as good of a week um, as we expected. So considering your max amount with or without utilities, um, and then some <laughs> some bills aren't always included in landlord paid utilities, such as cable, internet washer and dryer use or parking. So your rent might be cheap, but what other things are you going to have to tack on to that? And then considering what you're able to put towards um, total and then figuring out where this rental lies within that matrix. So the application process, um, you know, when you have to, when you're interested in a rental unit together, you tend to have to like fill out an application to the landlord. So if you're doing it with multiple people, you can ask kind of who's going to be the one to apply um, and who's going to be the one paying for the application fees. Uh, most times application fees uh, include background checks um, and I've seen them be anywhere from 25 to $60 a piece. Um, who's gonna be shelling those things out? And um, how is that going to be equitable for you? Does anybody have a barrier to getting a unit and how will you address it? Um, as mentioned, background checks are pretty standard with most units these days. So if you have um, credit issues, evictions, or a criminal history, or, not e or even just no references, no professional references, landlord references, character references, or anything like that, um, those things will show up. So how are you going to navigate that? If one of, uh, like if there's three people trying to rent a space together and one person has a credit score of 520, how are you going to work on that? Um, and then, you know, how are you going to work through an eviction? It's very difficult to get a space within an eviction. Do you have any documentation that shows that you've done everything you could since then? Um, that shows context to the eviction and why you've made sure that um, you won't be in that position again. Uh, with criminal history, what can you show that you've done to rectify that? Um, have you been in anger management classes? Have you been through a um, rehabilitation program? Um, do you have a flawless prob probation record? Um, those are all good things to know and to be aware of because if you don't tackle it now, you're going to have to do it while you're in the midst of an application. And sometimes landlords won't even get back to you. They'll just simply deny you and you won't even have a chance to fight it. So um, another thing to consider is if you have all your paperwork, a lot of times landlords want pay stubs to show that you can afford the space, uh, photo IDs to make sure that you are who you say you are, and references. Again, these can be character references by people in your community who can vouch that you are responsible, um, that you're trustworthy, that you're honest. Um, and uh, it could also include employment references or um, most importantly, landlord references. If you've rented from somebody in the past and you have a good record, that's all very important. 
Um, and then another thing to consider is who's going to be speaking with the potential landlords. So uh, if one of you is way more charismatic or has more experience speaking with strangers, maybe that person should be the person doing the communications if they put a good um, like face forward. Uh, and then also who's going to be seeing the units? What times work for everyone? If you all have different work schedules, are you gonna be able to find time to schedule to see an apartment together or will someone have to um, just base their opinion off of photos and testimonials from the other potential roommates who did get to see the unit? These are all things to discuss before you even start uh, applying to spaces. So finding a lease that works for everyone. Uh, generally, a lease is the uh, legal requirement, like a contract, that outlines the responsibilities and rights of a tenant and landlord. Um, they usually say what, how long the, um, the tenancy is, so whether it's um, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, or even if it's just month to month. Um, and it will talk about rules that people need to follow. Um, such as if pets are allowed or um, who gets what parking spots. Um, but leases are an important thing because they are the backbone of your entire rental agreement. So when you're starting to get a lease or you're talking to your landlord about leases, um, for shared spaces, it's good to ask about separate leases. So um, generally, there's only one uh, lease per unit, but if there are multiple people who are not related to each other, not dating, um, and have no real ties um, beyond just being roommates, it's really good to get that separate lease. Um, it just means that each person, each roommate will have a separate contract. Usually they look identical, but they just have a different name on them, which gives you more control over your personal responsibility for rent and to avoid repercussions of a roommate who doesn't follow through. This means that if one of the roommates is not paying their rent and you're facing a potential eviction, your um, if you, as long as you have a demonstrated history of paying your rent and you're not violating your lease, your name will not be on that eviction and that it will be specific to just that roommate. Asking about separate utilities, if possible, um, things like uh, electric, gas, water, phone, internet and or cable. Um, separate bills can be done for a lot of things like phone, internet and entertainment subscriptions, but oftentimes in shared rentals, um, water, gas and electric need to be in just one name, but you can always check with your utility company and see which things you are comfortable with sharing a name on and which you are not. So when you're so ready to sign your lease, you know, ask about who gets the security deposit back. Um, and generally you should be splitting your deposit, meaning that each person pays a separate, you know, their own separate, the equal share of the, um, of the security deposit required for the unit. But sometimes people have more cash that they can put down. And um, sometimes, uh, People will, especially if it's just a roommate who is leaving a lease um, early or leaves when the lease is up and the other ones don't, um, sometimes the other person can buy out the other part of the deposit when they leave and then just get that money from the new, uh, the new roommate. Um, either way, it's important to make sure that the landlord knows who has what money where and that it's in writing so that there's no issues or misunderstandings or assumptions when it comes time to pay back that security deposit. Because ideally you want your security deposit back so you put it towards a new place and you don't want any issues uh, when that happens. So considering how long of a lease you want, month to month leases are known for being really flexible but there's little security or stability if a landlord wants to raise rent or stop renting to you. Um, depending on your state, it's um, your laws can be very different about how long a landlord has to give to notify you that you're raising your rent or how much they can raise your rent, um, and they can you know and how often they can kind of just tell you that they're not going to be renting to you anymore and how long you have to sort yourself out and get into a new space. 
So it's nice that you can leave a space um, pretty flexibly, um, especially if you're looking for something short term. However, again, you know, the landlord can do that same thing as well. Um, and you have a lot less uh, notice. So other lease terms usually are, are for six months, 12 months or two years for most residential units. Um, you can always try and negotiate and see where you're going to be um, and you know, generally just work on one that works for both of you. All right, so considering that your lease is signed and everyone's moved in, we're gonna assume that everything's going great until it isn't. So living with another person can be really rewarding, but most people struggle with adapting to a new shared environment, especially one as intimate as their home. When problems arise, opt for mediation rather than confrontation. You both have the same goal, which is creating a shared and safe community at home. So it's important to remember that things will happen, disagreements will happen, but you do want to continue feeling safe. So these are some um, these are some ways that you can try to um, resolve conflict with your roommate, and these really kind of work for everybody in your life whether it's a coworker or a boss or somebody cutting off in traffic, <laughs> um, just considering those things and how, um, how it makes you feel and how you can use those feelings to uh, inform better decisions. So in this situation, we'll just talk about trying and avoiding certain things. Um, so choosing an appropriate time to bring up an issue face to face. Um, doing this live, we had the situation of a client who mentioned that um, he's very frustrated with getting uh, with getting home and having the garbage not being taken out. So I will use that as an example. Um, so if you got home and your roommate hadn't taken out the garbage, and this is a constant issue for you, we would try choosing an appropriate time to bring up the issue face to face. Probably not when you just get home and you're tired and you're frustrated and your roommate's not home and you are sending, you want to send a mean text message or leave a angry voicemail. Um, it's better to try and do it when you're cool and calm and collected and not um, when you're upset. So considering the context of the problem before addressing it, is there a big reason why this person may not be taking out the garbage when they get home? Um, have you thought about that? Does it not work with their work schedule? Um, do they have a bad back? Uh, do they have a sensory issue and they really can't stand um, touching something that's touched garbage? Consider those things. Like, is maybe there something that we could do as a team before we um, just kind of go on the offense? trying to use kind, honest, direct, and objective language. Um, so when we do actually approach our roommate, we're going to try and use um, language that doesn't feel really pointed, is not hostile, and doesn't just isn't just filled um, with a lot of rhetoric. When you are con discussing this with them, use active listening. Don't just focus on what you're going to say next. Listen to what they're saying to you. You might be, be surprised at what they're saying. Um, offering a few possible solutions. Um, folks enjoy when you give them some options and you uh, demonstrate that you have been thinking about ways to problem solve. So give them a few options. Maybe they can, maybe you can alternate nights that you take the garbage out. Maybe if they don't like taking the garbage out at night because it makes them feel unsafe, maybe they can take the garbage out in the morning on their way into work. Um, consider some of those things. Um, being willing to compromise. So realizing that sometimes the garbage isn't the biggest thing going on. Um, and maybe if you are okay with taking the garbage out full time, it might mean that they will be okay with washing the dishes full time or being the person to vacuum full time. Uh, addressing things at the start rather than letting resentment build. Um, this seems like a silly thing, but it really is easy to let something small grind at you if it's been going on for weeks or months. So maybe after the first few times that you notice it, that it's becoming a habit, bring it up then rather than waiting months until you're literally steamed at even seeing a garbage bag. So things to avoid. Being passive aggressive or lashing out at your roommate. So do not come home and empty the un, 
the, the unemptied um, bag of garbage on their bed in retaliation. Um, do not simply let it pile up um, until there's bugs around. Like that is not solving the problem and it's not communicating accurately your own needs to your roommate. Placing blame or shame on them. Um, you know, shame is one of the least effective motivators for human behavior. And it definitely um, is not a way that you want to work on your relationship with your roommate, even when you have um, differences you're getting through. So try and avoid that. Um, avoid ganging up on them when other roommates or mutual friends are around. Nobody likes to feel like they're being tag teamed. Um, and it's also another way to embarrass them and make them feel like unprepared to have this conversation. This should be something that you work on collaboratively, um, not something that should feel one-sided. Um, avoid centering the conversation on your needs or wants exclusively. Um, this is, again, something that's collaborative, which means that it involves both of your needs and wants. And while it's important to let that person know how you feel and how their actions are affecting you, you also want to remember that this is a shared space for both of you and that there could be needs and wants they have that are also kind of at work at this time too. Um, avoid slacking off on your responsibilities as payback. Um, same thing, let's not let the garbage just pile up just for no reason at all, um, just letting it get gross and nasty and making it a big scene. Um, avoid being rigid and flexible on a possible resolution. Um, you might have brought in some solutions that you might want to see implemented, but it's really up to the two of you to decide which ones you go with. So do not just be gung-ho strict into the thing that you want and the only thing that you want, because it will lead you to just being disappointed once again if they don't hold through. And then avoid trying to bring up every tiny issue. Um, consider whether the garbage, staying an extra night, is that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Again, when you're living in a really intimate space, little tiny things can feel like a big issue, but it's important to give yourself time to just breathe and decompress and come back to it. And remember that this is a, you know, a relationship between the two of you. And sometimes it's not always that big of a deal. So what happens when somebody leaves, um, primarily when somebody leaves a lease before it's up? So all good things um, must come to an end. And when they do, there are some options that you can take to handle it. Remember that someone's situation can always change and it's your responsibility to uphold your promises to your roommate, making sure that your actions do not negatively impact them when you leave. Give them the same courtesy that you would want them to give you if they were leaving. So a common thing that we see um, when folks leave a shared living arrangement is that somebody will just sublet the room. So if you're the one who's leaving, uh, because you got a better job offer or you're moving in with a, your partner or something. Um, you can always rent your room out or your space out to another person for the same amount of money that you are paying. Um, it's kind of them taking over the lease generally, um, but you have to make sure that you are um, finding somebody um, that is going to be just as uh, responsible and respectful as you are. So making sure that you um, secure somebody in that lease before you leave, uh, making sure that um, your roommates and your landlord knows that you are subletting since that person will not be on the lease, you will. They're not getting a brand new lease. They're simply taking over your own lease. And making sure that the new sublet roommate is a good substitute for you and really just for your other roommate's sake. So when you're leaving, um, it's always important to talk to your landlord. If you can't find a sublet um, or there's some kind of extenuating circumstances around why you're leaving, speak with your landlord. Um, and you do not want to jeopardize your other roommate's status at that location. And you, um, there are sometimes ways that you can kind of get out of your lease of beforehand. Sometimes people can forfeit their security deposit to get a month out of it. Um, and sometimes paying a little bit extra, um, but it's ultimately up to the landlord. 
uh, if your roommate is um, is suddenly leaving, you should always speak to your landlord about your status. Let them know that they are leaving and um, make sure that you are able to contribute in their absence. Um, and if you are looking for another roommate in their place to fill them in on what that process looks like. Um, ideally, just like you wouldn't try and leave your roommate in a jam, you wouldn't want your roommate to leave you in a jam where you are now in an apartment that you cannot afford by yourself. Um, but in those situations, it is always important to let your landlord know as soon as possible. Because if you wait until you're a month or two behind on rent, they're gonna be a lot less sympathetic than if you were to give them a heads up, let them know what you're doing and how you're handling it. So when you're trying to find a new roommate, either to replace your roommate who left or to um, get yourself um, a sublet um, roommate in your place, um, you can always follow the steps in part one and try when we were talking about finding a roommate um, and then remembering that new roommates mean new house rules on uh, new, new utility agreements and then new opportunities for friendship. And once again, keeping your landlord and other roommates informed during your search, the new person will likely need to be cleared by them as well. Um, that means you want to make sure that you're finding somebody who doesn't have any barriers that the landlord might not want or that your other roommates might not want. All right. Well, breaking a lease is something that nobody likes. Um, you are breaking a contract that you signed that said what you were doing and how long you're going to be doing it. Um, but sometimes that has to happen. When you do need to break a lease, you need to give your landlord as much time um, and notice as possible. Um, I generally recommend making a statement in writing with the date, signing it, sending it to them, and then provide any kind of needed documentation they might need. If you're, um, if you're breaking a lease because you've fallen ill and um, you, know, you need uh, to be home uh, be in somewhere else where someone's going to take care of you, um, or you've um, accepted a job offer somewhere else, like whatever documentation you can provide for them that you feel comfortable that doesn't violate your own personal privacy, it's good to just make sure that they are understanding that this is a, you know, an important circumstance that you have to leave. Um, accepting that there will likely be a fine um, and a penalty on your credit if you do not settle up all uh, rent, fees, and utilities before leaving. So while breaking the lease doesn't necessarily affect your credit, uh, it can be very expensive. And a lot of times landlords will try and make you pay um, the money for the rest of the lease. Um, so if you uh, are leaving um, eight months into your 12 month lease, they may require you to be paying the, uh, the last four months um, before you leave. And there might be a fine on top of that just for breaking your lease. These are things that are usually um, uh, in your lease itself. So it's important to read through your lease before you make that decision. Um, that being said, if you do end up having a big, you know, big fine and a big sum of money that you need to pay that you are not able to and you leave, it will be something that they will send to collections. And if you don't pay that, that will uh, affect your credit. Um, and then again, checking your other your lease for other stipulations that you agreed to when you signed the lease. Breaking a lease is better than getting evicted because it's not a, in itself a um, something that goes on public record. And uh, if you have the finances to be able to break the lease without um, you know it affecting your credit, you can usually get um, get away with it without any real lasting relationship or real lasting issues. However, it will ruin your relationship with that landlord and your roommates and landlords do talk. So there are lots of landlord um, groups and clubs and um, charters and they will um, they will speak about you and um, it will be very hard to rent in that area again. As always, speak with your landlord about your options before you decide to break a lease. Um, breaking a lease should be um, a last step decision. And uh, it really is, it's never good for anybody, but of course it happens at times and it's important to try and um, avoid it when it can. All right, so part three is um, more than mates, making home feel like a safe community. This is really mostly just about 
how we can um, make this space that we're living in feel safe, affirming, and collaborative, um, where we talk about things like house rules, paying rent, um, shared expenses, pooled resources, planning shared experiences, um, splitting responsibilities and privileges, considering culture, meals and groceries, pets, parking, privacy, and mediation. So healthy cohabitation, safe spaces help relieve stress and anxiety, which leads to better physical well-being, creating routine, security, open communication, and space for collaboration will reduce stress and lead to more fulfillment. House rules are super important, and they're pretty much the um, scaffolding that is going to support what you can and cannot do in the space that you're sharing with somebody else. So um, it really is just that it gives you a great outline as to what's accepted and what's not. And it's something to do at the very beginning, um, once you get into a space or even sometimes before when you're screening roommates to discuss the things that you are okay with and not okay with in your space. So this can include what time is lights out or music off at night. Some folks like to listen to music really late or watch TV really late um, or really early. So what time to what time is that kind of stuff okay in? Are there certain foods, scents, or lighting that could be an issue for someone else in the home? Um, so these are questions like, you know, are there any religious uh, issues or like uh, dietary issues with food? Um, are scented candles a no-go because someone has a pet um, or uh, is like flashing lighting or strobe lighting not okay because it makes somebody feel uncomfortable or it could trigger a seizure. These are questions to ask um, and to agree on at the very beginning. Um, are there any items that cannot be shared? So if somebody has a $600 Vitamix blender that they don't want anybody touching besides themselves, it's important to talk about that now um, rather than coming home to seeing their blender being messed up by somebody else. Um, and then uh, which spaces are off limits? What doors can be locked? What are areas that everybody's allowed in? These are questions that again seem really self-evident until you're actually talking about them with other people. Are there any items, substances, or activities that are not allowed in the home? Um, some folks don't feel comfortable with firearms in the home. Some people don't feel comfortable with um, substances in the home, especially if they're in recovery. Um, are there certain activities that are not allowed at, at the home? Like have those conversations now so that everybody feels comfortable um, at all times. Um, parties, when are they acceptable? How many people and how late? Uh, you'd be surprised what one person's party is compared to another person's party. One person's party might be three people on a cheese plate. Um, another person's party might be 30 people and a DJ. So it's important to um, consider when that's okay, how that's okay, what kind of notice you need. Just get that out of the way now. So when you were paying the rent, it's um, a good thing to uh, ask how you're going to do it. Who's paying the landlord at what time, what day? Are you guys paying together in a lump sum? Are you, um, you know, are you going to um, be paying separately and making sure that everybody knows what time um, they should be having the rent money? I usually recommend choosing a time in advance to have rent money. That way, if something happens and someone's short 100 bucks, there's enough time for the other people to maybe scramble or come up with options as to how to make up that before the rents actually do. Um, how are you going to be paying rent? Um, are you going to be doing it with cash if, or check? If so, make sure you get receipts. What about bank transfers? Um, it's very easy right now to set up automatic bank transfers that go into the form of a paper check and go right to your landlord. Um, ask about how that works. Uh, what about Venmo, Cash App, or Zelle? Again, if those are the cases, make sure you have very clear receipts and you keep them, even if it's a screenshot, um, so that you can keep them in case there's any kind of dispute about who has paid rent and who hasn't. Um, and again, if you're going to be working out of one bank account, um, whose account's it going to be and who's going to be getting them the money um, otherwise? 
Um, and receipts, yes, receipts and records document everything. You might think it's a waste, but I'm telling you, it's not. So getting smart about shared expenses. Um, consider about who's the one to pay for what each month. Um, maybe you have a shared cable bill. Um, is it okay if somebody pays it you know, every other month and the other person pays it the ulterior months? Um, see how that works. Uh, Reevaluating your expenses every three to four months to make sure that everyone's paying enough and that new charges or price increases are taken care of. This is especially um, important for even just things like um, sh like shared grocery amounts or um, utilities like gas or electric, which may fluctuate every month um, based on the weather. Um, it's good to look at your shared expenses and to keep a spreadsheet, make sure that, you know, no one's being blindsided by Netflix raising their rates $2 or, or whatnot. And then making a note of new expenses, like things people buy for the shared space and making sure that whomever pays for it um, has it come out of joint expenses, whether you keep a pot of money or money aside somewhere that you use to um, pull out of it or whether you just take it out of someone's rent. Um, it's important to keep tabs of that so that nobody feels like they are, you know, shouldering the entire apartment on their own back. A great option um, is to get a whiteboard where everybody can put down their expenses um, and tally it up at the end of the month. So a great thing about having um, a roommate is that pooling of resources. So you're sharing appliances, furniture, and decorations, which can make it easier to furnish a home um, and you know keep things that are um, really livable because you, you're not gonna be forced to buy a whole new um, living room set or like all new kitchen stuff um, together. So try and share as much as you can. Uh, making joint shopping decisions for new additions to the home. So maybe you do want a new uh, television set. You can work on that together. Um, figure out what kind of budget you're looking at and see who wants to do what. Uh, sharing employee discounts, memberships, or meal sus subscription plans. Um, these are great ways to help save money. And uh, you'd be surprised um, how easy it is to do when you've got multiple people involved. Um, I know personally, um, my partner and I have a BJ's membership and it's kind of like a Costco and uh, it's so much easier to do it with multiple people than if it was just one of us. And it really helps save money because you can buy in bulk, um, which is kind of the next bullet point, buying in bulk to save money. It's, it's easier to buy um, you know, something like flour or rice um, or even just fresh vegetables if you're buying it for three or four people rather than if you're just buying it for yourself. So sharing um, experiences together, planned activities are a great way to connect with your roommate and providing um, positive experiences you can lean on, especially when you are getting into it with conflict. Um, consider things like sharing dinner together one night a week, uh, organizing a game night together with just... Um, just the housemates or even with friends, um, watching a certain TV show together where you can have that shared experience, planning a day trip somewhere, um, maybe it's somewhere local, maybe it's somewhere like a little farther away, or starting, starting a new hobby together, like learning how to crochet little stuffed animals together. So splitting responsibilities and privileges, um, you could do a 50-50 split of everything, um, including like your, um, the, all the shopping or the chores around the house, things like that. Or you can do it just based on likes, dislikes, um, schedules, skills, or abilities. Um, maybe somebody is just really good at scouring the bathroom and that is their thing. And they get that as one of their things. And as, um, since they don't, you know, since they're really good at that and they're not really great at vacuuming, somebody else gets that. Uh, don't fall into gendered stereotypes on who does what in the house. Um, you know, we all still manage to uh, fall into stereotypes 
And um, I would just encourage folks to not assume that, you know, the femme is going to be the one who's doing the dishes every night and don't expect, you know, the mask to be the one taking out the garbage. Um, work on something that feels more uh, more equitable and, and that you feel like actually serves both of you and not just some idea of who you're supposed to be. Uh, if you both want to utilize the space separately, like a balcony or deck or like the kitchen, um, decide who gets access to the space and when, like making arrangements. Um, one uh, roommate may be really into meal prep and really want to know that every Sunday afternoon they have access to the kitchen uninterrupted in order to make their food for the week. Uh, maybe somebody really likes utilizing um, the backyard to do yoga um, in the evenings is important to make sure that folks have access to those spaces um, and just know uh, whether you have an agreement on it that when somebody gets something on their own. So considering culture, um, learning about your roommate's culture, religion, or traditions um, is not just responsible, it's just kind. Um, being aware of your own biases when considering habits or routines different from your own um it's you know, not everybody likes the same sense or you know um really feels comfortable or with this right the same clothing but you know it's important to be aware of your own biases when you um when you view those things ask questions respectfully and also use the internet um your roommate is not entitled to or you as a roommate are not entitled to a full lesson on another person's culture or religion or traditions um, in the same way that a stranger is not entitled to you having to explain your gender identity to them um, or your sexuality to them in detail. Um, you can ask questions, but remember that, you know, the emotional labor is really on you to learn. Uh, ensuring that other guests that you have are respectful to your roommate's culture. So do not allow people you have over the house to be rude or dismissive or to criticize your roommate's um, cultural identity. Um, it's important for you to be that mediator um, and ensure that they are going to feel safe. And be open to making compromises and helping educate each other when issues arise. This is, goes back to that context is really important for trying to problem solve and you know maybe somebody's incense in the home isn't something that you want to be around or maybe somebody's altar is in an area of the house that you don't want it to be have a kind and understanding um conversation when these issues arise and make sure that you keep um that other person's needs um whether they're you know spiritual or cultural um, make sure you keep them in the uh, in the forefront when you come up with a solution together. So with meals and groceries, food can be a touchy subject for a lot of folks, but consider trying to, to um, bond over it and to keep healthy boundaries, such as asking if they're interested in cooking together. Um, you know, see if uh, having meals together is something that you would like to do. Um, it's a great way to bond and to decompress at the end of the day. And it's always um, nice when you can make something for each other. Um, when you're shopping around, see if there's ways that you can pool together resources to buy toiletries, cleaning products, or food staples. If you all drink the same type of milk, see if maybe just getting milk for the house is something that you can do. Um, you know, what about toilet paper? Do, does everybody need to buy their own separate toilet paper or can we all work on that together? Um, considerations while sharing a kitchen, such as one person's idea of a clean kitchen is not necessarily the other person's idea of a clean kitchen. Um, so being conscious of the variations and what somebody might uh, consider clean or, um, you know, what, what somebody might consider dirty. So when you're doing that cleaning and then being kind enough to um, constructively discuss um, those differences uh, when they come up. Being clear about who can eat what. This is something that I think is very important regardless of who you're living with. Um, bring something home that you're expecting to eat yourself and then you go in to find it having been eaten by somebody else is a different level of terrible. It just, uh, it feels very invalidating and frustrating. 
So um, have very clear boundaries about who gets to eat what foods in the house. If you have things that are things you all share together, like bread or certain fruit or butter uh, or margarine or milk, um, consider those things as something that you can share. But if there's something that's your own, like you buy a very um, expensive brand of hot sauce and you don't want other people to use it, you have to say that. Uh, if you bring home food that you brought um, that a family member gave you, um, that they need special for you, say that so that other people aren't gonna eat it. When in doubt, I generally encourage people to label everything, have different bins in the refrigerator, um, have sticky notes, have cute labels you get custom made from Etsy, whatever floats your boat. House guests. So it's good to uh, have a conversation about how many guests are allowed at home. And, um, and how many, you know, are there any times that guests shouldn't come over? So um, if they're, you know, if your, uh, your roommate uh, takes a night class on Thursday nights, maybe that's not a good time to have your friends over to play video games or to, um, you know, watch your favorite show. Maybe considering those times um, where it really needs to be quiet for them and for yourself. Um, sectioning off common area times for regular guests. Um, if you and your friends like to watch Drag Race whenever it comes out and you are always in the living room at that time, make sure that everybody knows that. And um, just, you know, that way it can be an unspoken um, common rule that, um, that those areas are for you, for those guests at that time. When you have people over, um, consider where they park. If you have um, parking spots that are assigned to you for your unit, um, make sure that your guests are not in your um, your roommate's parking spot and are not blocking any parking. And then um, with overnight guests, how how does it work? Who gets to stay over? When does they when do they get to stay over? Do you need to give notice to your roommate? Um, these are all very personal questions that are going to vary depending on um, where you go and who you um, who you're rooming with. But it's important to talk about that before it gets um, uncomfortable. So uh, when you have roommates and you have pets, uh, it's good to have um, rules pretty much spelled out about where those pets can go and where they're not allowed to go. Um, maybe your cat isn't allowed in your roommate's room because they're allergic. Um, maybe your dog is not allowed in the backyard unsupervised. So make sure that they aren't. Um, who's responsible for the pets? Is this one of those things where your roommate is okay with feeding your cats um, when you get home late or is okay with watching your pet when they're not, um, when you're not there? Ask about it. Um, but don't assume that somebody is going to um, care for your pet without you there, um, even if they've already done it in the past. It's important to ask every time. And then what are rules when the pet owning roommate is not home? Um, so if you don't like your dog eating table food, then your roommate should not be feeding your dog table food when you're not home. Um, just meant, like knowing that there's consistency um, is important, not just to owning a pet, but to being in a shared space with other people. We touched on parking before, but um, not everywhere in this area um, here, down here in Fairfield County gets their own parking, uh, like in a driveway. But even if there is, uh, you have to consider who's getting what parking spots, um, how many cars are allowed. Um, and then if you have assigned spaces and it's not like off street, consider doing arranged, um, arranged rotating spots. So maybe somebody gets, um, the, uh, the one parking spot for the unit, maybe they get it every other week, um, or maybe they get it on the weekends because that's when they are home the most. Um, just whatever works, it's just another thing to think about when you're sharing a space. So privacy, um, we mentioned in part one that there really is no such thing as total privacy when you're sharing a space with anybody. Um, so considering that kindness and consideration are key when you are sharing a space with somebody else, respecting a person's body, space, and possessions um, in all the spaces. So that means, you know, not looking at your, uh, 
not looking at your roommate's iPad when they leave it out on the um, on the couch in the living room is just as important as not going into their room and looking through their drawers. Uh, just because you have access doesn't mean you should be looking at other people's things um, or poking around in other people's business. Uh, understand that you may not be able to always control how you look at all times and you may see your roommates looking rough. Um, this means no makeup, no wigs, no binders, or other things that make us feel ourselves, but it's part of it. And to be kind to yourself and your roommates, this is especially important, um, I feel like, for our community, because sometimes um, just the way we look and the way we feel about the way we look can really influence our mood and our day. Um, and you have to give yourself some kindness um, and trust that your roommate may see you not looking your best. And that's okay. And in turn, you may be seeing them also not looking their best. There is a really special intimacy and vulnerability to this. But as long as you're kind and you give people as much um, distance and privacy as you can, you're in the right, you're in the right mode. So mediation and addressing conflict, um, it's we're always going to have spats and disagreements with people that you live with um, and even people that you don't. So when that happens, um, how do you handle it? Uh, if somebody has an issue with your landlord, how is it handled? If there's a problem with a neighbor, how is that handled? Uh, you know, talk about uh, tackling those issues together and also look to yourself to see how you could handle the situation better and in a way that feels more holistic and is gonna inform your relationship in the future. When you are trying to talk through your differences, again, consider active listening, making sure that you're focusing on what they are saying and what that means as opposed to um, just being inside your own head and not um, really hearing what they're saying and just thinking simply about what you you want and what you're going to say and how you're going to counteract it. Um, consider collaboration. The fact that this again is a um, this is a group partnership. This is something that you are both working towards together. So it should be equal and it should feel like both people have a say in it. Be solution focused. Um, it feels good sometimes to just yell at somebody, but it's not going to solve the problem. Um, look to how the actual issue could be resolved and um, focus on that solution together. And again, focusing on your timing and when is a good time to bring something up. Um, if you're, if you're, uh, your roommate is tired or they're in a bad mood or they've had a rough day or a rough week, um, consider maybe saving this for uh, a time when they're feeling more focused and um, more capable of having this conversation in a way that's meaningful. Because just like you don't want to um, kind of be blasted with something when you're not feeling the best and you're not prepared for it, neither do they. All right, well, that is the presentation, um, I want you to think about these three questions um, as we uh, reflect on what we discussed uh, during this presentation. So um, our pop quiz questions uh, include, what are two different tips found in the training for talking through differences with a roommate? So we've talked a little bit about that in um, part one and part three. So what would some things be that you might think about? Number two, uh, name two examples of house rules. So examples of house rules could be ones that you choose or ones that are listed here. Name a benefit to participating in shared housing. We spoke to about this um, at a length in part one, and I would um, encourage you to come up with your own um, things that you think of too. Um, when you consider benefits of having a roommate. Well, I thank you so much for being with me um, and taking the time to learn about shared housing and how it could be a really great option for a lot of folks, especially um, 
LGBTQ plus folks who may be facing a housing crisis themselves and might be having trouble navigating through um, housing uh, in Connecticut and beyond. So thank you again, and um, we'll see you soon.